Hello and welcome to Book Bites, a book club podcast for developers. We recently read and talked about a children's picture book called Ara the Star Engineer by Komal Singh, which was a bestseller on launch day. And today she's been gracious enough to join us to talk about her book. She's a program manager within engineering at Google on the ads infrastructure team based out of Waterloo, Canada. And she was inspired to write this book when her four-year-old daughter told her that engineers are boys. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure being here. So I love the story of what inspired you to write the book. You know, one day you're working from home and your daughter saw you on a call with a bunch of engineers and you're explaining who they were and they're all guys. And she said, oh, engineers are boys. So just curious if you expand on how did that make you feel? And uh, and then what motivated you to actually go and do something about that? Right. So, you know, I've been a woman in tech pretty much my entire life. I grew up in India in the 80s, and I took a lot of computer science courses during high school. I then went on to do my bachelor's in computer science, where, again, I was a minority. And, you know, me and the girls in my class were maybe like 10 to 15 percent of the population. I then went on to do my master's in computer science. And again, we were the minority, perhaps 15 or 20 percent women in our class. And I've been working in tech for the past 13 years or so. And I think we all will vouch to the fact that uh, women are a minority and especially women of color. So I had always felt strongly about, you know, wanting to do something to, to shift the ratio, but I just wasn't sure what can be done and what I can do that might be more fun and more captivating for people to hear and see. So although I had the desire to do something, I just didn't know what it was that I could do in my personal capacity. However, it took to me being a mother and hearing my daughter proclaim that engineers are boys that really, really bumped me out and made me think really hard on what is it that I can do. So I started researching more and more and I started discovering that when it comes to kids' picture books, only about 5% or less books are actually authored by people of color or feature girls or women in, um, you know, superhero or the protagonist roles. And this combined with the fact, with research, that girls start doubting their intelligence in STEM as early as six years old is what propelled me to think about writing a book because I think that's a fun way to talk to kids and to grown-ups for that matter and to make things more whimsical. That's how I came up with the idea. I started this project as a 20% project at Google. And for those who are not aware what a 20% project is, it's basically that you as a Googler can spend 20% of your time, your work time, towards a project that you feel strongly about as long as it's also aligned with, you know, company's uh, mission and values. So I started started this uh, book project as, as a passion project, as a side project. And, you know, with time, as people heard about it, they, they started pitching in with their ideas, with with skills that they could help out with, such as um, writing, editing, giving feedback on illustrations, designing websites, designing activity sheets and whatnot. It took us a long time because we were all new to the process. It just took us two years to get to the stage of finding a publisher and then finally publishing a book. So that, in a nutshell, is the story behind the story. Yeah, so I, I read somewhere that when when your daughter said that, you didn't know whether to feel sad, angry, upset, disappointed. You said bummed out. Yeah. So was it really a surprise to you that she said that? It was a surprise. You know, I tend to think that me and my husband, we expose her to a wide array of things such as, you know, books on coding and, and STEM based activities. So I thought we were doing a good job at not introducing any sort of bias from our end. Like she's free to play with princesses if she wants, um, free to play with, you know, coding based toys if she wants and read such books. And she does all of that. But then for her to actually pick up on the hidden social patterns that we see in our society uh, that I was maybe trying to hide from her was quite a shocker. And, you know, kids are such smart creatures and they're such strong parsers of patterns, as I call them. Hmm. And she was able to definitely parse that social pattern. How do those social patterns relate to those you experienced as a child in India? So, you know, 
Being a minority in all of my computer science courses, I remember there were times when our teachers wouldn't even take us seriously. They thought we were we were taking these courses for whatever reason. And if we ever got some quiz right or high marks on quizzes, they thought it was just a fluke. So they were never yeah. quite took us seriously and it annoyed me. Luckily, I had a set of parents who both are very, you know, strong supporters and feminists. And my dad being an engineer always encouraged me to do whatever I felt like doing. And I wanted to be an engineer like him. So he he was such a staunch supporter. But a lot of people don't have such kind of support and I feel that it is because I had such a strong support system I was able to do what I wanted to do yeah such stereotypes and biases exist everywhere you know I have to admit that your story sounds a lot like mine and that I've been in the industry for about 13 years I went to college and I was like one of two women in a class of 30 developers and you know it was really tough going through that but you know, instead of having like that staunch support, I remember my mother sitting me down like around the time I was hitting like 12 and said, you know, you can do anything you want, but you have to understand that there's going to be a point where you hit hard on that glass ceiling and there's not going to be much you can do about that. Very rarely do women ever break through that glass ceiling and you're going to get frustrated when you hit it. But sorry, that's how it is. And that made me so angry that day. And I feel like the reason why I actually made it to become a developer is because I wanted to prove that women could do what boys do better. Yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. And, you know, your mom was coming from her place of truth, right? And um, the fact that she's been able to raise a daughter who's been able to break the glass ceiling is testament to the fact that she did something really right. And again, you know, that somehow is part of your support system, even though she might have given you the wrong advice because that was coming from her place of truth. But yes, I was at a stage where it was anger that propelled me and fueled me, uh, me wanting to prove to others that I can do it. But I think over the years, that has changed. Over the years, instead of feeling angry at such situations and people, I actually just feel sorry for them. And it's not about them anymore. It's it's more about me, me wanting to do something because I have the desire to do it uh, for my own self and for my reasons. Exactly. It was that moment where I realized that I programmed because I loved it. I loved the problem solving. I loved the puzzles. I loved almost the instant gratification of seeing something compile and function and I could do something with what I was doing. And it did change very much from that place of anger to that place of wonder. But I'm not sure that I would have gotten to where I am without that little bit of anger to fuel me on. And I do secretly wonder if my mother told me that because she knew it would fuel me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. You never know. I'm curious to know, one of the really interesting things about your book was the fact that you featured some of the real women that you worked with. Where did you get that idea? How did you pick the specific women that you highlighted? And what was their reaction to being featured in the book? Right. So, you know, I I do read a lot of books with my daughter. And every time I read a book, once we were reading a book about Ada Lovelace, a children's book, a picture book. And then she told me, oh, mama, I want to meet Ada Lovelace. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's going to be a problem, but we can read more (laughs) about her. And then one day we were reading about Grace Hopper, another fantastic children's picture book. And then again, she said, I want to I want to meet Grace Hopper. So I was like, um, yeah, okay, that might be another problem. And and that's when I thought, you know, why don't we show kids today's equivalence of Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper? And that's how I thought of featuring real-life women superheroes, you know, who you can probably reach out to and meet in person, see them in flesh and blood. Because I think when kids can see something, they relate with those things much better. So, you know, I thought about the people that I admire at work, people I look up to, and the four superheroes or sheroes, as we call them, that are featured in the book are are ones whose uh, tech talks I've heard many times, and they represent, you know, a very diverse spectrum of cultural backgrounds, uh, skin colors, as well as uh, tech specialties and age age range. So that's how I kind of narrowed down on maybe like seven or eight 
hoping that, you know, even if like one of them says yes, I'll, I'll feature one in the book. But luckily, pretty much all of them said yes. Uh, some of them replied instantly to the proposal that I had written for the book and why I want to do this book and the vision that I had. So then it became a problem of narrowing down from seven or eight to four, because that's how the script evolved. Uh, over time, we, we thought that, you know, four might be the right balance so yeah, I mean, their reactions were instantaneous and they were all very happy and excited to hear about such a unique uh, way to potentially close the gender gap through a children's picture book. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, and I think it's really neat that all of those different women were available to you in the places that you worked at and you were able to like recruit them and they were on board to be a part of that process. Yes, definitely. I work out of Waterloo in Canada, and they're all based out of the Google Mothership in Mountain View. And they have crazy, you know, travel schedules. They're always at conferences and whatnot. So in spite of all that, you know, because they believed in the message of the book, they made time for interviews, they made time for polishing up the manuscript and making it all a reality. I did see a lot of myself in this book. And I realize again, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly for my daughter is, but I'm not. It was still exciting for me to read this book because I had, you know, luckily similar heroes when I was younger. I swear someday I will meet Diana Howard and you know, swoon, flush, and I will try not to faint. However, when looking through this book, it was amazing to see not just age differences and, you know, ethnicities and cultures experienced you know throughout this book but you also had different physical abilities there were people in wheelchairs you had all sorts of people and it was really magical that no matter who you are young or old you know walking or wheeling you know you could find yourself in this book and you know with that in mind I also wondered about the illustrator and how closely you worked with the illustrator. I noticed going through the book that, you know, sometimes our knees are skinned and sometimes they're not. And sometimes there's one bad day and sometimes there's two. And I love the fact that you kind of get the progression of time while she's trying to solve these problems through something as simple as a childhood injury. Yeah. Um, so I love that question. And when I actually read that question on the you know, the email, I was, I was smiling because we worked so hard on the fine details. So the illustrator, about the illustrator, first of all, she is based out of Istanbul in Turkey. And I found her very randomly. There is a site called Behance, and that's sort of like an Etsy for artists, um, especially illustrators. And I, I saw her work on that site, and I reached out to her. And then, of course, I was also talking to many other illustrators through many other connections and other mediums. And the thing that I loved about her, besides being her amazing talent is that she felt really strongly about the cause of the book. And that's what I wanted. I wanted someone who was passionate about the cause because I feel, you know, passion trumps talent and I needed that. So that's how I wanted to work with her. But then once I had sort of finalized the illustrator, I also discovered that she has been a guest doodler um, and she has done a couple of Google doodles as well. So it was like a perfect match and yes, we worked throughout the illustration process. There were many, like we had pretty much weekly meetings where she'd send me the sketches, not just me, but, you know, the entire team. And we would get on a hangout call and we'd discuss what needed changes. And we'd try to give her sneak peek into the tech world. We put together a fairly extensive uh, mood board where we put pictures of from so many places, from like 10 of us putting pictures on the mood board, which can be overwhelming for the illustrator. And at times it was because there was just so much detail. But I guess everyone wanted the book to have so many elements. So again, you know, diversity matters because everyone had such different life experiences in the world of tech that they wanted to put on their mood boards, which eventually made their way into the book. And towards, you know, crunch time, we even had 
um, meetings with the illustrator three times a week. So trying to make sure that the book represents, you know, real life scenarios and is inspiring for not just children of one kind of genre, but children of many different kinds of genre and backgrounds. So on the mood board, you said that there were a lot of things on there. What is the particular thing that you put on or what is a specific thing that, that you can tell me about that was placed on there and kind of has a little more backstory to it? I can tell you a few. One is, uh, so in the book, Ara and Didi, they go through various locations. They go through coding pods. They go they go to an ideas lab. They go to X space and they go to a data center. So for each of these four locations, we had many, many slides on our mood board for data center of course we had uh, pictures of many data centers and what people working in the data center look like we wanted to show kids you know how small we look inside a data center like the perspective needed to be huge for kids to realize how huge data centers are so there were pictures of lots of racks and um, lots of pipes and uh, people walking with their trolleys to fix things for the coding pods, we, of course, had pictures of real-life coders, somebody, sometimes people who are sitting in, you know, in a ball pit and coding, and sometimes they're having coffee and coding. <laughs> sometimes people are just, like, scratching their head and writing things on the whiteboard. So all of those pictures were from real-life coding locations that were put on the mood board. There's a hangar that's in, uh, in the Moffat Park um, in Mountain View, and that hangar is depicted in, in the launch pads in the book. So that's based on a real life artifact as well. The Paul Pit sounds problematic as far as programming goes. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised at how many times I've seen people code inside ball pits. <laughs> <laughs> Don't your computer sink? Oh, I think they have some sort of a stand. <laughs> Uh, Jason, didn't your daughter have a question from the illustrations? She did, yes. So I was reading with my daughter just the other night, and she, uh, or I told her that I was speaking with, with the author and said, any question that you have, we can get answered. And so we stopped on the Innovation Plex page, which I just love that page because there's so much in it that I catch something new every time. And... One of the things she pointed out was that Ara now has a hat on when she arrives at the Innovation Plex. <laughs> and she had asked me, why does she have a hat now? Right. That's so cool. So the reason she has a hat is because at Google, we have this culture of newbies being called Nooglers. So Nooglers are people who are new to Google and you know, by tradition, they, they get this hat. It's called the propeller hat because what it signifies is that you're going to do great things and you're going to fly high. So those are called Nugler hats. So we wanted to depict that Ara and Didi are coming into a place of learning where they will begin anew and they're sort of being welcomed into the Innovation Plex or being indoctrined into the Innovation Plex through these hats. That is awesome. I will definitely pass that along. She will love that. Yes, cool. And if you just Google Nugler hats, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right. That's awesome. I'm, I love that there's actually an answer to that question. And it wasn't just, oh, this is just some weird thing that we could throw in that would look cool. <laughs> so there, there must be a lot of those types of things throughout the book. And I think especially on this innovation plex scene outside the building. Is there anything in, in on that page that you would like to point out that's really special to you? Yeah, so I'm on that page. And actually, a lot of people who contributed on this project are on that page. They've been illustrated on the page. So about 10 of us are on that page. So so I'll let you discover which one you think is me. Oh. Hmm. Then, you know, the glass building that you see. I don't know if you noticed, but there is uh, shadows or reflection of things that are inside the building. And each of those things actually turns into a location. There's a reflection of data centers. There's there's a reflection of X space as well. Nice. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else. I love Easter eggs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there's, um, there's something called a spaceoid. There's like a capsule that's going up in the space. 
It's like a space elevator. So, you know, that spaceoid might make an appearance in the next book and might have more of a significant role. Oh, you said next book. I, th- I believe that was one of our questions is, do you plan on writing any more books? I do. We all do. However, what I do want to do is I want to I want to take the feedback of readers, especially young readers, into account. I would love to know from them, you know, what is it that they want to see in the next book? Do, do they want it to be based of, of real life characters and what kind of topics do they want to learn or hear about? Maybe they want to hear about artificial intelligence or maybe they want to hear about computational numbers so soon maybe in the next couple of months we'll open up a form and i would love your help to spread this form with with young readers and grown-ups for that matter so that we are able to take the feedback into account for the next book nice what is some of the feedback that you've heard so far about the book from younger readers and did any of it surprise you So, yes, a lot of children have told us that their favorite page is the bio page at the end, where we actually show the real life pictures of the sheroes that are in the book. And they have loved reading about uh, the work that they do and seeing their pictures. So in the beginning, we were a little bit hesitant about including that page because we thought maybe there's too much detail and kids might not want to read about all these details. But, But then we decided it needed to be there to you know, give closure to the story. So it was really nice to see children appreciating um, that last bio page. Oh, yeah, this is another interesting one. We, We introduced the concept of algorithm in the book. And again, we were debating whether or not it's too techy for children, whether or not they will like it. But turns out kids have loved, you know, using that word and also writing their own algorithms for things like feeding the cat, Things like going to school, like what's the algorithm to get up from bed and go to school? So they're already breaking the big problem into smaller problems and thinking in terms of steps. So that was another really nice surprise. I would agree that my daughter spends a significant amount of time on the bio page every time that we get to the end asking, who's that and who's that and who's that? And we often go over each person a couple of times. So it it is a great highlight there. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And I love how, I mean, I think it's so important for kids to hear, oh, yeah, she is a vice president. Oh, yeah, she's an engineering director. So think about how that fires their neurons. My daughter is extremely maternal. She never goes anywhere without at least two babies. She takes better care of them than most parents take care of their children in general. It's really impressive. So when we're going through the book, uh, she points at things. She goes, can I have a doll of that? Can I have that baby? Can I have that one? (laughs) I want that. So it's been interesting. It's like she loves the book in the back because it's something that she can hold and she can relate to. Ara itself, the book is a bit too big for her to carry around. And it can be a bit too unwieldy for her to hold at four years old. So she carries around the little notebook that's in the back. But what she wants also are the babies, the dolls, the characters that she can then take and put into her own situations and to develop them. So I've had to get like really artsy and craftsy in terms of like some of her LOL surprise dolls or something into engineers in order to help her get that. But it's been interesting seeing how she's taken the story and then developed her own after that. Amazing. That gives us so many ideas. I mean, maybe we should think about um, creating some puppets or something based on the characters that kids can touch and, carry around another thing that's covered in the notebook of ara's notes it has the four c's that that are brought up throughout the book the code courage creativity and collaboration and how did you come up with those four things right so you know um One thing that I had very clear in my mind is that I did not want this to be a book about coding. This is not a book on how to code. And this is not a book that is telling children that coding rules 
above everything else. I definitely wanted to give children the message that to be a leader in engineering, to be a leader in the world of computer science or coding, you have to be more than just a coder. You have to have the skills to collaborate with your peers and take their feedback, which is very important. Um, you need to be some creative with ideas, come up with novel solutions to old problems. You need to have the courage to try new things. The path will not always be rosy. You will have failures, but what's more important is that you try and bounce back up from those setbacks and failures. So I was I was very sure that I wanted to showcase all of these qualities of being a leader. And, you know, right now, those qualities come out very nicely with the four C's in the manuscript, but it wasn't always like that. In the earlier drafts, there was just so much narrative that the simplicity of the four C's wasn't coming across really well. And that's how we decided to actually extract all of the technical details from the narrative and make the book more of a layered experience and put the tech details in the notebook and in the activity sheets and then just focus the story based on the four C's so that um, you know each of the heroes can be giving one of the C's as a badge of honor to Ara and Didi. Or in this case, a bracelet. That's right. In this case, a bracelet. I'm really impressed by how you all have actually extracted these nuggets from the book that we worked very hard on including. So thank you. We loved it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been great. Yeah, so pretty much um, each of the C's, the four C's, is represented by a bracelet. And then, you know, the Shiro hands over the bracelet to Ara, which represents a lesson learned about, let's say, coding or courage, creativity and collaboration. What was the motivation behind using the bracelet as a symbol for, like, the knowledge that Ara gained throughout the story? And what was the process like towards getting to that symbol? So from what I've seen, all sorts of children, girls, boys, and non-binary genders, they all love crafting things. They all love making things. And uh, bracelets is something they all end up making for whatever reason. And I've seen lots of children make their own bracelets. So we thought that this is something that, you know, when they get into, into the story and they pick on this nugget about bracelets, they could actually create their own bracelets on their own, which doesn't take too much time and it's a arts and crafts project and then they could wear it as bracelet as a badge of honor or a bracelet of learning yeah so that was the thought process behind the bracelets i absolutely adore that the thought process is they could make it themselves yeah throughout the book ara has her companion Didi, and i really love that Didi is is such an approachable thing it's not a kind of sterile computer but rather a very friendly droid that that helps boost her up especially when times are down i sometimes wish that compiler errors would be as nice as that for me <laughs> and uh and so my question for you is why did you choose that representation of dd for a computer so firstly we wanted to show the children that you know it's humans that that control a computer and not the other way around and that if you know how to control something in a ethical manner you can actually make that thing work for you work to your advantage and that thing can be your companion it can be your assistant and help you do things faster and help you in your path of problem solving so that was the idea behind coming up with a robo sidekick that could accompany Ara and also introduce some humor into the story because the story can tend to be technical at times. So Didi introduces humor into the story and um, Didi is programmable. So children know that, you know, it's programming computers to follow their commands is in their hand. And then the word Didi actually comes from the Hindi word, Didi, which means an elder sister. And in Chinese, I've been told it means brother. So we wanted Didi to be gender neutral as well. So you will see that throughout the narrative, we don't actually refer to Didi as he or she. It's always just Didi. And um, we wanted um, kids to just have this companion, this older sister or older brother, so to say. 
think, yeah, that's that's about it about Dee Dee. But with Dee Dee, it's not about commanding her. It's still about or him, but it's about working with Dee Dee to come to a solution. It's about that collaboration. And when it comes to technology these days, everything from Alexa to Cortana to, you know, hello, Google, we've got all of these machines that are just begging to be controlled and commanded. And I, I like the fact that the commands weren't part of this book, that there was still that level of compassion. I mean, I even expect my child to say please and thank you to the machines we command, because I think part of it is the voices that go along with it. Uh, if we're commanding women, for instance, that we're just allowing that stereotype of that's how you speak to women to continue as well. So I just appreciated that about the interactions between Ara and Didi as well. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we wanted the interactions to be respectful. Yeah, I, I love the scene where they're putting code on Didi and then the message on Didi says yummy code. Yes, because Didi's so, eating something that's food for Didi. Yeah. Yeah. There's one page where Ara is being explained what an algorithm is. And Didi's screen says, all got rhythm. So we thought that might be a fun way for kids to remember algorithm, all got rhythm. <laughs> That's what are some of the reactions and reviews that you've heard from adults about this book? And how are they similar to or different from what kids have to say about it? Right. Reviews from adults have been another endearing factor. You know, when I was writing the manuscript, my husband is not a techie. He's from a mechanical engineering background, but he's never quite done computer science related work. So when he was reading the manuscript and he was like, oh, yeah, I understand, you know, things like what an algorithm is and how do you go about coding? And I've had so many mothers and actually fathers come to me and say that they feel they've learned about the process of engineering problem solving through the, or they've been able to get a glimpse into it through the book and uh, they've been quite fascinated with it and um, you know that they can actually use words in everyday vocabulary words such as uh, coding languages um, what are some of the coding languages so a lot of grown-ups have come to me and told me that they've learned from the book as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. One of the things I find when I go do a lot of work, like speaking about my career to children, is sometimes their parents have a very hard time understanding what it actually is, and as a result, kind of struggle to get their kids involved with it or to push their interest in it further. So I think it's really great that with the picture book, it's accessible and universal to all readers. Right. So since you said your initial motivation came from your daughter, how how what does your daughter think of the book? And has it changed her attitude towards engineering? Uh, yes, it has. But it has done so in a very subtle manner. Actually, uh, the book uh, launched in China a few months ago. And both my daughter and I, we went to China for the launch of the book. What, somebody asked her at, at the Shanghai Book Fair, what do you want to be when you grow up? And um, she said, oh, I want to be an author and an engineer. She's saying that because she sees me as an author and she sees me as an engineer. So that was extremely endearing to hear. But I told her, you know, you can be anything you want to be. You don't have to confine yourself to what your mom is doing. And she said, yes, but I want to be these things because if I'm an author, I can, I can create books that the whole world reads. And if I'm an engineer, I can build my own things, anything that I want to build. So, yes, it has definitely shifted her perception as well hmm. on what she can achieve. That's awesome. That's really inspiring. <laughs> yeah. On the Ara the Star Engineer website, there are a number of resources there for learning about interest in engineering and are there any particular ones that that you've spent time on with your daughter yes so there are a bunch of activity sheets about 12 or 15 of them and all of these activity sheets are designed by real life engineers people who helped me design them and they're themed on the book but they teach a concept so one of those is called deconstructing dd and that's actually a arts and crafts kind of activity to build a computer 
so you're basically building DD from its individual components, such as the memory and the processor chip and the sensors and the motor, things like that. So a lot of kids really enjoy doing that activity, and, and so does uh, my daughter. That is great. I have to spend more time with that material. We have been stuck on the book, and it, 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 like, it has definitely proved to be readable many times, but uh, that may be one of our next places we venture. We, we have checked out the code.org where you tell Angry Birds what to do, and she liked getting the pigs but she loved blowing the bird up with tnt and so uh <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely check that out okay so i'm kind of one curious about what it was like to finally get through this project and finish it and get the the final copy in your hands and to get the kind of reviews that you got like the one from eric schmidt the former ceo of google um where he said Ara and her friends are more than just characters. They're models for girls and boys to follow if they're curious about the world and want to build a better one. Mm -hmm. Yes. So throughout the conception of this book, I was actually pregnant with my second child and I had my baby and I was on maternity leave. So most of the work on the book was done while I was pregnant with my second child and on maternity leave, we get one year in Canada. So one year off with my second baby. I'm still on mat leave, by the way, and I go back to work very soon. So, you know, producing this book to me has felt like producing a third baby. Like it has mm. all the anguish, all the turmoil, all the joy, everything that goes, that comes with a pregnancy. So yes, it's very dear to my heart and it definitely to me is, is my third baby. And yes, when we did get that review from Eric Schmidt, I was I was speechless. I I wasn't sure if it's a real review. I mean, I thought maybe somehow he thought he was reviewing something else. <laughs> but he, he does he does mention the name Ara. So then I had to actually cross check before we put the review on site. Uh, we we checked with his EA team, and yes, they confirmed it was from him. So, so we did our due diligence before putting up that review. Um, but also, more importantly, there were some, some of my favorite kids' books authors. One of them is the author of Hello, Ruby, and the other one's the author of Women in Science. And the fact that they endorsed the book was a great um, source of validation for me because they're some of the best authors, and I admire and love their work. Um, so that was another great validation to have endorsements, not just from tech leaders, but also from kids' book authors. Yeah. Well, uh, congrats on, on the book and, and on your new baby as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for putting all, in all the energy to, to create this. I think it's a huge contribution to the world. Thank you. It's been so much fun talking to your entire team, and I've really enjoyed how thorough the questions were and how much you know, enthusiasm you put into reading the book and extracting all the fine details. That was just so nice to hear. Yeah, it was fun. I look forward to hearing about the, the forum for the, the next upcoming book that you plan so we can pass along feedback. Yes, please. I will, I will be sure to share that with you all. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.